Hi everyone, so this is our third installment in the Cost Accounting, Capital Budgeting, and Cost Analysis series. And in this video, we're going to be speaking specifically to net present value method. So it's our third uh, capital budgeting model. We've already introduced the payback period and the accounting rate of return. And now we're working specifically with net present value method. So when working with the net present value method, we're going to discount the cash inflows to their present value and then compare that with the capital outlay. Now remember capital outlay is simply the cost of the asset. So what we're basically doing is taking the difference between the present value of the, disc the, of the cash inflows and comparing that with the cost of the asset or cost of the investment. And when we're doing this, we want to make sure that we're always comparing the discount rate, which is the investment must meet or exceed this rate to be acceptable. So this can also be called the required rate of return, or RRR. You may have heard it called that. This can also be called the expected rate of return. And it can also be called the hurdle rate. <clears throat> so at the point where net present value is zero, the investment return is equal to the business's required rate of return. So whenever net present value is above zero, then that means we're getting above the discount rate or the required rate of return. So the higher the net present value, typically the more attractive the investment is. And we're going to see where that, that may not be true in some instances here in just a few minutes. So let's look at an example. We're going to use the net present value method to determine whether salon products should invest in the following projects. So we're going to look at project A together. So project A costs $272,000 and offers eight annual net cash inflows of $60,000. Salon products requires an annual return of 14% on projects like A. So unlike the payback period and the accounting rate of return, which did not incorporate the time values money, net present value as well as the IRR, internal rate of return, do incorporate the time value of money. So we're going to be using our present value factor table, um, which I'll show you here in just a second, to be able to calculate the net present value. So let's go ahead and look at the table here. So this is the present value of an annuity table. So we can see the annuity there. The present value of a dollar table, we also call that present value of lump sum table. So if there's just one payment, then you would say that's, then you would use the present value of lump sum table. However, in this case, we're getting eight annual net cash inflows of $60,000. They're the same payment over and over again for eight years, and that's, so that's an annuity. So we need our annuity table, and they're telling us that they're eight annual periods, so that's eight. We'll go to the line eight on our annuity table, and the return is 14%. So if we scroll over to column 14%, we find the annuity factor to be 4.639. So we're going to use this factor in calculating the net present value. So keep in mind when you're using these tables, these factors that you're looking up, they incorporate the compounding of interest, they incorporate the interest rate, and they incorporate the periods. And if you're into um, fancy formulas, if you're a finance person, there's the formula for you to actually calculate the factor. All right, so here is project A. So the first thing that happened is, is we invested in project A for a total of $272,000, and we did that now. And the value of that $272,000 right now is $272,000. And that amount of money is going out of our pocket, so that's why you see it in parentheses here. It's an outgoing of cash. The $60,000 annual net cash inflows is a positive number, and it's an annuity. And that's going to happen years one through eight. And we looked up our present value of annuity factor at 14% to be 4.639. If you multiply that times $60,000, we're 
we get the present value of those eight cash inflows of $278,340. When you get the difference in the present value of the cash inflows and the capital outlay of $272,000, we get a net present value of $6,340. That's a positive number. So this would be a good invest, investment per the net present value model. Now, keep in mind, the net present value doesn't tell you what the return actually is. It only tells you whether you're getting more than your required rate of return, whether you're getting your required rate of return, in other words, net present value would be zero, or you're not getting your required rate of return. That would be where net present value is negative. In this case, we know we're getting more than our required rate of return. We don't know how much more, but it's probably not a lot more because it's a small number. The net present value is pretty small. All right, so I've circled um, Project B here. I would like for you to give Project B a shot. See if you can figure out the net present value and determine if Project B would be a good investment. So push pause on your player now. Come back in a second, and we'll look at it together. So for Project B, you should have found an annuity factor at 12% of 5.328, because this was another annuity, so $70,000 was our cash flows every year, same amount. And so the present value of those cash inflows would be $372,960, which is less than the capital outlay. So our net present value here is negative. So B would not be a good investment because our net present value is negative. So the next question here is, what is the maximum acceptable price that you'd be willing to pay for each project. So let's bring back project A on the screen. So now we have projects B and project A. So what is the maximum price that we'd be willing to pay for each one of these projects? So let's look at project A first. Now in project A, we had a positive net present value. However, I would be willing to pay up to 278,000 $340 for this investment because at that capital outlay, net present value would be zero. And recall, where net present value is zero, we are actually getting our required rate of return. In project B, I would only be willing to pay up to $372,960 because at that, point, at that point, net present value would be zero and I would be getting my required rate of return. So what do we do when it's not an annuity, when the payments are not equal? Well, in this case, we have to use the lump sum table, the present value of lump sum table, because we're doing net present value, so we're always gonna be focused on the present value tables. We just have to determine, is it an annuity or is it lump sums? So here, Bevel Industries is deciding whether to automate one phase of its production process. The manufacturing equipment has a six-year life and will cost $900,000. Projected net cash inflows are as follows, years one through six, and notice they're all differing amounts. We need to compute the project's net present value using Bevel, in Bevel Industries' possible 14% rate. Should Bevel Industries invest in this equipment? So as you can see in this example, we still have our capital outlay of $900,000 which would be worth $900,000 today. And years one through six, we have lump sum mounts coming in at different times during that period of time. So we go to our present value of lump sum table. So in the present value of a lump sum tables, you would simply go right down the line once you find 14%. So year one, the factor is 0.877. Year two, the factor is 0.769 and so forth. So what this is actually telling us, if we think about it, is we would have to have $79,000, $79,800 today to end up with $175,000 at 14% in six years. And that's what each one of these is telling us. So what we find when we do this, we actually find a negative net present value. So we now know that is a bad investment. And it's quite large, so we're not getting anywhere near our required rate of return on this investment. So let's add to this story just a little bit. Bevel Industries could refurbish the equipment at the end of six years for $100,000. The refurbished equipment could be used one more year and provide $75,000 of net cash inflows in year seven. Additionally, 
the refurbished equipment would have a $50,000 residual value at the end of year seven. So knowing this information should Bevel Industries invest in the equipment and refurbish it after six years. So a hint is, in addition to your answer to what we just did in part one above, discount the additional cash outflow and inflows back to the present value. So give this one a shot. Press pause on your player. See if you can figure out now, knowing this information, would it be a good investment at this point? And come back and we'll take a look at it together. So as the story tells us, in the sixth year, we can have an additional capital outlay of $100,000. So at this point, we're back here in year one trying to make this decision. So it's asking me, what would I need to invest today to have $100,000 in six years? So we'd go to the present value of lump sum table for year six, and the factor was 0.456. So we'd have to invest $45,600 today to have $100,000 in six years. In year seven, they tell us that we will have actually two cash inflows in the same year. So it'll provide $75,000 of net cash inflows during year seven, and then we can sell it for $50,000 at the end of year seven. And the seventh year present value, a lump sum factor at 14% is 0.4. So in other words, we would have to invest $20,000 today to end up with $50,000 at 14% in seven years. That's what it's basically telling us. So now we see that this additional information gives us a positive net present value of 4,400. So now knowing this, is this a good investment? we actually find this is not a good investment because if you'll remember, the first six years prior to the refurbishment was almost a negative $20,000 net present value. This 4,400 positive net present value does not outweigh the negative net present value in the first six years. So this is still not a good investment. So I said earlier that we typically would pick the investment with the highest net present value. That is true if the investments cost the same thing. But what if the investments have differing initial costs and they all have positive net present values? Do we just simply pick the one with the highest net present value? That isn't necessarily true. We want to use something called the profitability index when we're looking at multiple uh, investments that have positive net present values and differing initial investments. So we have a formula we want to use when calculating the profitability index. And that formula is we're going to take the present value of the net cash inflows and divide that by the cost of the investment. So what this is going to give me is the number of dollars returned for every dollar invested. So for every one dollar that I invest in something, how many dollars is it going to return? Is it going to be a dollar and fifty cent, a dollar and fifty two cent? How much am I going to get back for my investment? So let's use this simple example to determine which one of these investments we should really invest in. So Sheffield Manufacturing is considering three capital investment proposals. At this time, Sheffield Manufacturing only has funds available to pursue one of the three investments. Which investment should Sheffield Manufacturing pursue at this time? Well, under our original thinking, we would pick the one with the highest net present value. So initially, we would say, well, it's probably going to be equipment B. But what I'd like for you to do is use the profitability index and determine if that is true. So press pause on your player, calculate the profitability index for each one of these investments, and determine which one is truly the one we should invest in. So here are the results for the profitability index calculations. And what we find is it's not B. B is not the choice here. A is actually going to return a dollar and 13 cent for every dollar that we invest. Whereas B is only going to return a dollar and 12 cent for every dollar we invest. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when we're looking at millions of dollars in investments, 
that one penny can ultimately be material, especially when it gets up into the billions of dollars for investments.